used to lend us their aid for the navigation of our waters and to furnish us in return for our hospitality with abundance of nutrition. Moreover, there is no reason why judges and lawyers, legislatures and politicians, office hunters and lobby members may not, for many years, in their attendance upon terms, enjoy the advantages of conveyances upon a whale's back, infinitely surpassing the speed of the steamboat, newly invented, right, by Fulton, right in these years, and, of course, Mitchell, huge champion of the steamboat, a man of the future. And that the shores of the Wallabout may resound with the music which calls the dolphins to be milked, be studded with the villas where citizens shall repair to enjoy country air and dolphins way. The Bay of Gowanus seems designed by nature for the reception of whales. From them will be derived a rich supply of butter and cheese for home consumption and foreign commerce. So I hope you guys get the feel that this is a total send-up of the kind of um, mammal whale, right, the breasted whale, which New Yorkers have a time uh, teasing Mitchell about for almost 15 years to come. So uh, science uh, takes uh, a couple of kicks in the jaw in the mayor's court in 1818 with implications for the way American democracy evolves with respect to expert knowledge. And that's, again, one of the kind of larger take-home arguments uh, of the book. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop and um, would love to hear questions or our thoughts. Oil 
which is what we now call cod liver oil, although not purified, just raw, yucky. Whale oils are all tried oils in the sense that they are basically tallows. They are melted fat that is cooked out over a fire. So when the merchants get up there and the craftsmen get up there, they're like, look, there's all the difference in the world between these two products. You need inspections for fish oil because it comes to market with water, blood, scum, all kinds of horrible stuff in it because it's just leached out and then you know, they put a bung in the top of the barrel and sell it. It's horrible stuff. Whale oils are cooked at you know, hundreds and hundreds of degrees and boiled. And if you put even this much water in such a uh, conflagration of oils, the whole thing would explode. You've probably done this at home. You put a little olive oil, you put like, you know, the spinach in it, it's wet, it goes up in your face. The, 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 the guys who are accustomed to doing this kind of work say, it could never happen that a barrel of oil would come to market with water or other kinds of crap in it. It's pointless to inspect this stuff. It always comes to market clean because it's a tried oil, it's a towel. So in that sense, Lee is sort of, he's just being a pain really, sticking up for his law, because my own reading of the situation is that the Chandlers are basically right, that it doesn't make sense to, um, to have the spermaceti oils come under the inspection designation. But for those of you who are really hardcore, I'll make one additional tiny point, which is um, when, when um, Judd and his buddies try to say, look, by fish oil, what's meant is liver oil, uh, Lee and his buddies come right back at him and say, oh yeah? Well, what about Manhattan oil? So what's Manhattan? Any, any fly fishermen here from, with their places on the Cape? Manhattan is a small bait fish, about four inches long, which fly fishermen know well because the basic lure for catching stripers and bluefish on the northeastern coast in the spring and summer is a Manhattan fly, a fly that looks like Manhattan because Manhattan are the basic bait fish that are consumed by those fish on this coast. There was an enormous fishery which sained Manhattan and pressed them for oil. Not their livers though, because they're really tiny. You'd have to do like microsurgery to get their livers out. So basically you just put all the Manhattan in like an apple press to make, you know, like you use for making cider and you just go Bleh. and like what comes out is sort of an oily scum. But this is used by the, by the, um, by the tanners to be like, not so fast, it's not the case that all fish oil is liver oil, because Manhattan oil is definitely fish oil, but it doesn't come from the livers, it comes from the whole bodies. Gotcha there, he replied. So this is the level of sort of stuff that you have to uh, get into, not to enjoy the book. <laughs> <laughs> this stuff is in the footnotes. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Well, was fish oil used for anything else? Um, yeah, a good question. What else was fish oil used for? Uh, not much, actually. It turns out that the vast majority of uh, fish oil was being sucked up by guys like Gideon Lee, who were trying to like take the tanning, the, the tanning craft up to like industrial scale, and that's again part of the story. He's really going for vertical integration at this point because he's building tanneries that are so huge that they're basically acquiring the entire extant stocks of the basic raw products in order to come to the market. So uh, people did use it for lubricants. It was used in making uh, oil cloths. So um, if you wanted, um, you know, now some of you may own barbour waxed cotton rain gear, which is all the rage, you know, in the horsey set in England, it's like, what people did before they had Gore-Tex, you take a cotton, a tight woven cotton, and you treat it with a mixture of oils and waxes to make it um, impermeable to water. This was the only thing people had for slicks at that time, because you before um, people's ability to um, uh, use rubber. Rubber is a tropical product, as you know. It's um, found in, by tapping trees. Those trees are not substantially tapped until the 1860s and 1870s. And anyway, until the vulcanization process is developed, uh, rubber is incredibly disgusting. It feels like an old banana after a couple of weeks. So if you made a rubberized coat, it would be like wearing an old banana after a couple of weeks before the vulcanization process. So people use fish oils for making um, brain slicks, uh, but in combination with waxes and that kind of stuff. Um, and nobody ate it. It was not something that people ate as a vitamin supplement.
Yes. Was this term well used for uh, light, the provided light in the animals? Absolutely. Spermaceti oil was the primary use of spermaceti in this time, was in the production of candles. Uh, those spermacetis as liquid waxes could also be burned in lamps. Um, again, if you really love going down and dirty on this, spermaceti oil is not an oil, it's a wax, for starters. Um, and it is different from ordinary whale oil. Ordinary whale oil is what happens if you take a right whale and you kill it, you strip its body fat off, and you melt that down. And that is a product that is basically indistinguishable from tallow, from, from water. And people also burned that. There were tallow candles, there were tallow lamps. They smell kind of yucky because it's burned fat, but the poorer classes used those fats in their lamps and as candles. Spermaceti, if any of you have ever, would there be a way that you would have experienced spermaceti? I mean, basically, no. Um, spermaceti, if you've had a chance to see a spermaceti candle? Or yeah, I have quite a few of them. They used to sell them when they touched. Yeah, I'm not, that's interesting. I wonder where they're probably getting them from the Soviets. Or the last no, no, no. They were, yeah, it was Older, oh, left over. Hmm. Right, because of course it's been illegal to kill uh, sperm oil since, uh, since 1987. But, ex except if you're in Norwegian. Um, but, but basically, spermaceti is uh, a very light wax, it's not a body fat, and uh, sperm whales have it in a case in their heads, and it's actually used as part of their navigational systems. So it comes from here, the case and what's called the, the, the junk. Um, so it's, a, it's the most ritzy and expensive and fancy of the oils that could be gotten from a whale. And this is also part of the argument that the guys make. They're like, it's insane to, to treat it like it's fish oil. This is like a premier product here. I mean, it's like, you know, if there was an inspection statute on, uh, you know, on, on, on what? On, uh, on you know, frozen shrimp, and you're, you're, you're making it apply to like, you know, beluga caviar that's been flown over in, you know, the personal keeping of a czar for the purpose of his private consumption. They're just totally, totally different. And for those of you who like uh, more Melville, and I'm a Melville lover, if you've ever tried The Confidence Man, which is Melville's sort of um, late and spectacularly failed novella about um, American fraud, the, one of the richest passages in The Confidence Man is the story of China Astor, a candle maker who invests in some spermaceti oil in the effort to increase his business, sort of a luxury business model by selling ritzier candles and is subsequently economically ruined uh, because of that and the possibly a parable for our own. Go ahead. So would you say then that uh, the Tweed Courthouse where Mitchell used to hang out was the fitting architectural habitat for uh, Gideon Lee and and Ben somehow? Yeah. For a connection? Between yeah, what a nice image. Um, yeah, I mean, it kind of metaphorically speaking, metaphorically, I think that is yes. lovely. Um, it, it's a nice image. Um, Part of what does happen, you know, concretely in this story is that um, the Mitchell's, ex uh, Mitchell's rather ugly reception by the Democratic um, Agon here sends him back over here to an institution that uh, has not just taken it on the nose in this episode but it's taken it sufficiently hard on the nose in this episode that it'll actually be closed down a few years later. And I mean, it's a bit strong to try, there's a lot of stuff that puts paid to the New York institution, uh, including an economic panic in, in 1819 and a lot of other stuff. Um, so it wouldn't be quite fair to say Maurice V. Judd does in the, the New York institution, but it wouldn't be entirely unfair to say that either, because it is a sort of, there's this delicate moment where the United States, I argue, could kind of go a different way in imagining the relationship between expert knowledge and, and democratic politics. And this case uh, spells the death of that philosophical vision for, um, for New York and for the Republic as a whole. So this institution will be closed down and kind of sold off as offices. New Yorkers will ask, why the hell are we using, pardon me, 
why the heck are we using taxpayer money to support a bunch of well-to-do patrician gentlemen so that they can sit around and muss about with shells and bones and this kind of stuff? Not a good use of taxpayer money. Yes. Uh, uh, when was the scientific issue settled? Did it have to wait until Darwin? Or so um, um, the question is, when was the scientific question settled? And um, you know, historians of science love a question like that. It it depends on who you ask. You know, I mean, for plenty of people, it was well settled by 1818. Uh, if you had asked the majority of sort of, how to put it, I mean, I was going to say professional naturalists, except those of you who are the kind of historical thinkers in the room would have immediately raised a flag, because there is no such thing as a professional naturalist at this time, right? You can't get a, a salary to be a naturalist. The natural history is, is not really taught in schools, like Oxford and, and Cambridge don't have professors in natural history. They have some folks who do materia medica and that sort of thing in a, in a kind of medical teaching environment. But nevertheless, if you ask the majority of people who were kind of sufficiently well to do that they spent their lives writing books about natural history in this period, most of them would have argued that they understood perfectly well that whales were uh, well categorized closer to um, quadrupeds, the traditional category of the quadrupeds, than more distant. But people had very different ideas about how to do that. Linnaeus himself, through the first nine editions of the system of nature, put whales in fish. And when he moved them out of fish and put them in um, mammals, one of his rivals wrote a furious attack, pointing out that he himself, Linnaeus' rival, had moved the larger category of the sea bears, which contained whales but also included manatees and walruses, okay, the plagiures, the bears of the sea, he had already moved that category out of the fish category and set it up at its own rank at the same level as fish and mammal. And so what does he say? He says this turkey Linnaeus has put it under mammals just to try to prove that he's not plagiarizing because <laughs> I'm the guy who figured out in 1756 that all those creatures didn't belong in fish anymore, and now comes along Linnaeus, claiming my discovery is his own, and setting it up in this idiotic way by actually putting them under the category of mammals where they don't belong, I have you know. But, so, even with those kinds of disputes going on into the later part of the 18th century, it is the, a case that most naturalists would have agreed on this by the beginning of the 19th century. And in fact, as for Darwin, um, Darwin was at a society dinner in about 1824, a little bit before that, right? It's before he leaves on the Beagle Voyage. And there's a, a kind of loud-mouthed society physician who thinks of himself as something of a know-it-all, who declares en passant in the course of the dinner that whales are fish. And, um, in a letter to one of his friends that he writes that night, Darwin's like, what an idiot, that guy, huh? I mean, saying the whales are fish. <laughs> so it was obvious to Darwin, well before his evolutionary theory, that no kind of serious person who was in the know would say such a dumb thing, although a person emphatically in the know, ostensibly, you know, a kind of very, very well put together physician who could travel in the best circles, could in fact say that in the 1820s. Uh, and nobody would call them out. That, that was in Europe. What about, <clears throat> what about in the United States? That's interesting. Um, Fixing with the abolitionist argument of the 20s and 30s, the recent Darwin book, which was yeah. those papers, brought mm -hmm. into the two, especially that quote man from the Dolphins. Very interesting. interesting. Very interesting. Um, my assumption is that certainly by the time that Joseph Henry uh, is sort of making the Smithsonian run, nobody there would have put. Uh, a whale specimen under a miscellaneous category. It would have been whacked right there under the mammals. I mean, the U.S. Exploring Expedition, which does its round the world um, tour 1838 to 42, none of those naturalists would have argued that a whale was anything but a mammal biome. So, again, in expert circles, everyone would have agreed on that. And indeed, um, by the end of the 19th century, whales become a very important example for the evolutionists. 
I mean, they get cited in the Scopes trial as one of the kind of best evolutionary stories we have because they are so clearly, once upon a time, a land creature. As many of you probably know, sperm whales, in fact, do have vestigial hind legs. Quadruped. They have vestigial hind legs. They're you know, about that, that long, and they're entirely buried inside the body. Um, and I've only seen one beach sperm whale, and it was sufficiently old and disgusting on a beach in Mexico that I wasn't prepared to do the work of digging in and looking for it, but there are these two little dingles uh, that they have back there in a vestigial pelvis. We should probably wrap. Yes, I was hoping to ask the last question, which yes. is, would you like to say anything about your next book? Oh, that's so sweet. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, this book actually was uh, kind of snipped out of a larger book. And that larger book was going to look at whales from monsters in the early modern period, wonders, to soulful, musical, friends of humanity, bellwethers of human environmental responsibility, totems of the counterculture, like Think Whales 1972. You know, um, and in the end, that was just going to be too big a book. So this got cut out as sort of the first half of that book. It does handle a lot of that terrain, the kind of wonders to emergence of taxonomic systems um, uh, of the Darwin period. And the rest of the book, will, it's hard to say when exactly I'll have it done done, but I've promised it to the publishers by the middle of this summer. And it looks basically at the emergence of the Save the Whales campaign in the 20th century. So it's about the role that scientists play in making us aware of the perils that these animals were facing as a result of the industrial whale fishery of the 20th century. Not this open boat, throwing harpoons kind of stuff, which really, people argue about this, but in my view, it didn't really do much damage to the populations. Um, there, there are very still serious arguments about the impact of the 19th century whaling uh, industry on whale stocks, but I'm on the camp that says it didn't really do that much damage. What did do damage was when somebody figured out how to make an explosive grenade in the head of a um, cannon-fired harpoon attached to a line. And then, apropos of the fact that blue whales and fin whales sink after you kill them, if you can believe it, figured out how to drive a compressed air dart into the animals to inflate their body cavities to keep them afloat long enough to be able to bring them aboard factory vessels. That, doesn't, that combination of stuff uh, doesn't really happen until the beginning of the 20th century. And um, it is that industrial whale fishery which um, nearly wipes out most of the world's major cetacean populations. And the last thing I'll leave you with, which is just a weird fact that you otherwise won't know probably, is that that industry was not for oils for illumination. Right? Nobody was using lamps, right, with oil in them in the 1950s. So what the hell are they doing all those lamps? Does anybody know? Corsets. What did say again? Corsets. Corsets, right. <laughs> corsets. Corsets, again, is the 19th century industry. You could have made a lot of corsets with 2.4 million cetaceans. Dog food um, and lubricant. Say again? Dog food and lubricant. Dog food's a great answer, and that is a big chunk of the, of the byproduct of the industry. So the industry is not interested in the meat, but eventually they figure out they can make some change by selling the leftover meat as dog food additives and fertilizer additives. But that's a secondary market. The primary market is the oil, and what are they doing with the fat? What are they doing with the fat? So. Saponification is also a part of the industry, but it is not the highest budget factor. It's probably about 30% of the revenue comes from saponification of the second rate fats, the blasted fats, the nasty fats. The, the majority of that fat goes to human consumption in the form of margarine. Margarine, margarine, is, uh, margarine in the United States has almost never been made from any serious fraction of whale oil, but that is only because of the extraordinary lobbying power, both of the American dairy industry, which was very defensive about margarine from the beginning, and the American um, agricultural lobby, which much preferred for corn oils to be used in those products because that was a native product that they could control, and since they've essentially won the 
Congress for most of the 20th century, <laughs> they've been able to keep whale oil out. But in continental Europe, and especially in Britain, uh, the primary ingredient in the uh, margarines sold in Europe between 1928 and 1965 was uh, whale oil. Pretty nasty. There you go. <laughs>